Hmm. Wrestling, you made my day. Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Definition, and this video we're breaking down episode 4 of The Boys. There will be heavy spoilers here, so if you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, then I highly recommend that you check out now. Make sure you subscribe to the channel as we'll be doing breakdowns on the show week by week, and you definitely don't want to miss any of them. Now with that out of the way, thank you for clicking this, now let's get into the breakdown. Okay, so episode 4 opens with women discussing what their idea of love is. This is revealed to be auditions for the Deep's wife, but it actually thematically ties into the episode itself, with pretty much all of the characters defining what love is for themselves, and then realising that they aren't really able to have it. Frenchie sees it as caring for someone in a moment that they feel lost, and because of this, he makes a move on Kimiko, but he gets rejected. Huey and Annie almost get together, but because of Vaught they're unable to. Mother's Milk discusses it in a story about his father, Billy through his wife, and Homelander, well, well Homelander goes on a pretty crazy arc. Now he's quickly becoming my favourite character, for all the wrong reasons. He has a real change of heart in this episode, and up until this point, he's pretty much been the most adored person on the planet. Everyone seems to love him, and because of this, his ego's gone completely out of control. Homelander felt so much love towards himself that the only person that he ever ended up loving was of course himself. Things change though with Stormfront becoming the face of the Seven and slowly he watches as all this love is stripped away and turned into hate. He pretty much relies on public admiration in order to feel good about himself, but throughout he realises how shallow that truly is and in the end comes to the conclusion that he doesn't need anyone to love him at all, not even himself. Pretty much every character in the episode tries to hold on to the thing that they love dearly, and because of this, they almost feel like they've lost at the end, except for Homelander, who decides to let it go, and thus he can move on. We'll get into it in a bit, but after the auditions we cut to Frenchie, who's mashed off his face, and he makes a move on Kimiko, who's still reeling from the death of her brother. In the wake of last week, we learn that Kenji has been blamed for the murders carried out by Stormfront, and the super terror villains are further used as a weapon by Vought in order to draw the public's attention away from the Compound V reveal. Now we learn in this episode that Stormfront is actually a racist soup that was alive in the 70s, and after she murdered an innocent black man, she faded into obscurity. Stormfront has changed her identity, and is now masquerading as this completely different person, fit with a new origin story. However, she's still the same person underneath, and holds the same prejudices, which is why she murdered 59 people, mostly made up of minorities, when going after Kenji. Stormfront gets more of a platform in this episode, and she very much represents how anger, and pointing the finger at the wrong group of people, can lead to a unified army of followers that will just carry out your agenda, believing that they're taking back power, when really, all they're doing is giving it to you. I don't know if that's a political metaphor, but seeing her make the American population hate supervillains, who, as we know, are all made up of minorities, definitely feels like it's touching on a lot of social commentary. The Seven themselves are thought to be very much a symbol of whiteness, and in the episode it's brought up that there's no real minorities in the group, except for A-Train, who, spoiler alert, gets kicked out of it even before this reveal. Now we discover that 92% of heroes are Caucasian, but as we know, far more exist than that, except for they carry the label of villain instead of hero. I could just be reading into that and how it's portrayed, but I do think that the show is actually setting up a reunion of the old seven, as there have been several teasers towards them. Stormfront, or rather Liberty, was a member, and we know that Eagle the Archer also was as well. Soldier Boy has also been name dropped, and as he's confirmed for season 3, it does seem like things are shaping up to go that way. Now, how she's managed to live this long without aging actually ties into Compound V itself. Though it's not been expressly said in the show, as far as the source material is concerned, it's hinted that Homelander might actually be in his 60s, and this is because the drug makes people age slower. Thus, it might even be possible that Stormfront is actually a lot more similar to a comic counterpart than initially thought. In our first three episode breakdown, we talked about how the real one was one of the bad guys in World War II. There's already been mention of Frederick Vought, and we do know that he worked for Germany during the war, attempting to create the Aryan Superman. Aya Cash is Jewish, and who knows, Vought may have experimented on her during the war, and this is where she gained her abilities. 
When Vought fled Germany, he could have taken her with him and hid her in plain sight. It is possible that because the character doesn't really age, that she travelled through the airs, taking on new identities, whilst pushing her agendas through the guise of social change. Liberty herself operated in an area that still has monuments of the Confederate flag, so it may be possible that she was actually leading a lot of racial tensions at the time. Well, that's just a theory for now, but I think they're slowly linking the character back to the comics, which I wasn't expecting at all when Cash was first cast. Now, she really goes to blows with Homelander in this episode, who's arguably at his lowest point ever. After killing Stillwell, he still craves her love because they very much had a weird Oedipus complex to their relationship. He wants his love more than anything, but of course can't have it, and all there is is this illusion of it. Thus, he's been meeting with a soup called Doppelganger, who's able to shapeshift. I thought it was absolutely hilarious when this was revealed to be some fat old dude, and yeah, you don't always get mystique. He feeds Homelander breast milk and comforts him as we see the world turn against the character. Together they watch Taxi Driver, which I actually think plays heavily into the show itself. Taxi Driver is basically about a crazy guy that turns into a vigilante one day and goes to an apartment block killing a lot of people. Though we as the audience have seen his personal life and know that he's not all there, the citizens of the story don't and at the end of the movie, he's seen as a hero, even though we know this isn't the case. This is of course very similar to Stormfront, who has self-destroyed an apartment block and then got labelled as a saviour. It's also reflected in Homelander, who breaks at the end of the episode and kills a version of himself. This mirrored standoff reminded me a lot of the scene in Taxi Driver, in which Robert De Niro says, You, you talking to me? And uh, that was terrible. And I liked how there was some symmetry with the character seeing a version of himself and then deciding to end it, much like how Rob's character did in the film. Elsewhere, we watch as Billy learns the location of his wife from his new CIA contact. After the death of Raina and the attack carried out by Stormfront, her conscience has made her realise that keeping things secret has led to her having a lot of blood on her hands. She has a recurring dream in which all those killed by soups sit there watching her, waiting for her to act. She's had enough of this inaction and hands over the details of not only Liberty, but also the location of the vault facility where Becca and Ryan are held. Annie, Huey and Mother's Milk go off on a road trip together and this is spurred on by Homelander threatening her in an elevator. Angered at her for not killing Huey, Homelander almost puts his hand directly through her abdomen. He decides not to murder her, but she still fears for her life. Now this is because we learn that one of her greatest fears is that Homelander will kill her and because of this, she says she walks around the tower with a constant knot in her stomach. Homelander putting his hand into her abdomen in an almost twisting fashion, though not intentional for the character, clearly has been done by the writers to mirror this knot to show that one of her greatest fears almost came to fruition. I thought it was a really subtle line that had a great payoff and also seeing Black Noir trying to get to the bottom of where Billy Butcher is was absolutely hilarious. I'm still not sure whether they're going to tie things in with his comic origins, but there is a little line that hints that they're not. Now in the comics, Homelander says that Black Noir is the member of the seven that he's known the longest, but in this season, we've learned that it's Maeve. So, though it could tie in, and I don't want to spoil the twist just yet, it does seem like they're actually going in a completely different direction. Now one of the things that I found interesting in this episode is that Huey and Annie really connect under a bridge, and Billy and his wife connect above one. Symbolically, bridges mean either hiding from someone, or getting over it, so Annie hiding under this shows the former, with Billy and his wife showing the latter. Could be reaching there, just, just something I picked up on. And let's be honest, this entire video is just one big reach anyway. Now, both Huey and Billy get to reconnect with the ones that they love, but because of their situations with Vought, we know that things aren't going to be easy. Both the women are pretty much controlled by the corporation, and they live in very vulnerable positions where if either were to leave, their lives would be compromised. This is why both Annie and Becca decide to stay where they are at the end, and there are a lot of similarities between their journeys. Now, someone who gets to leave the Seven, or rather is forced out, is A-Train. The character realises that he's getting replaced when he spots Shockwave in the tower, who you may remember raced against him in the first season. A-Train clearly loved being in the Seven, but he's unable to have it because of his heart problems. Again, this ties into the theme of the episode, and I think he's definitely going to become a wild card as we get into the season. 
We then cut to the road trip and get another Billy Joel song. So far, Joel has pretty much been the singer of the season and this scene marks the third time that one of his songs has been played. Initially it was Pressure and then we heard You're Only Human. This time we get We Didn't Start the Fire and it actually holds a lot of meaning to the arc that Huey has gone on. Now Joel actually got the idea for the song when he was in a recording studio with Sean Lennon who just turned 21. Lennon remarked that it was a terrible time to be 21 and Joel, who was 40 at the time, said when he was 21 he thought that it was awful as well. Lennon said that it was nowhere near as bad as it was for him these days and that nothing really happened when Joel was 21 which made Joel realise that a lot of things such as the Korean War, the Suez Canal crisis and more have been lost to time and thus he started putting together a track to show that there's always been a lot of big events in history that have kept the fire burning on the world. As we know, Huey thinks that he's having the worst time ever and that things have never been this bad. However, this song reminds him that things are always awful and yet yeah, that's a nice positive message I think that makes him not feel alone anymore, I guess. Now this is cemented when Huey meets a woman connected to Liberty and two discovers that superpowered people have always been corrupt. On the road we actually learn a lot about Annie and also Mother's Milk. The former says that her mother had her on a restricted diet because she was a pushy parent that wanted her to get into the seven. On the other hand, her father used to actually listen to what she wanted and allowed her to have treats, showing that he actually cared about what her goals were, whereas her mother only cared about her own. Mirroring this, Mother's Milk's dad used to take him to an ice cream store where he'd abuse their free sample policy and would taste every single flavour. Mother's Milk, eh? More like Father's Dairy. Am I right? No, uh, no, no, but the character does say that even though he was embarrassed at the time, he'd do anything to be able to go back once more and this ties into the theme. Annie too wants to save a person hurt in a car crash, but she must let this go in order to remain incognito. Now another great part of the episode is that we actually get to see Billy and Becca back together. They spend the night together on the bridge and we see how much she wants to leave, but how the danger that vault pose is what's holding her back. Becca threatened to kill herself in front of Ryan if Homelander didn't free Billy and this is how he survived the ending of the first season. They get it on that night whilst Huey does with Annie and though they promise to be together, we see how the hard light of day can change a lot of things. It seems like love but until you get an Ed Sheeran tattoo, it's obviously not that serious. Now one of the big shockers in the episode comes during an in-depth interview with Homelander and Maeve on TV. He outs Maeve and shows that he also knows about the girlfriend that she's been keeping quiet. It shows that Homelander wants either people in the seven that he can control through fear or he doesn't want them at all. At the end of the episode, I think it's setting up the fact that he will be taking the group out one by one and clearly has no qualms about threatening Maeve, Annie, A-Train or Stormfront. Looks like it's gonna just be him in Black Noir by the end of it, which, you know what, I'm not even that mad at. Now, he might not even need to kill Stormfront as we see Kimiko almost attack her at a rally. Frenchie stops her, but I really do think that she will get revenge down the line. Shortly after, we learn the truth about Stormfront and also discover that, because the person who accused her was black, that she simply wasn't believed. Vought paid her off and we still aren't really sure of what happened between her last appearance in 1979 up until today. She's pretty much used the internet as a weapon to turn the public against Homelander and it very much shows how social media can quickly change public opinion. Using memes she's launched a campaign to take him down, all while supplanting herself as the new leader of the Seven. In this position she'll be able to influence the public even more and turn the world into her vision. As I said earlier, I've done a complete 180 on thinking that they aren't making her in line with the comics and even her lightning bolt earring symbol is similar to the iconography that Hitler used to use. Becca meets Billy at the bridge but she suspects that he'll try and get rid of Ryan. Billy confirms this because he knows that Vought won't let him get away. Becca doesn't want to abandon him to be raised by the corporation as this will inevitably make him become another Homelander and thus she decides to stay. To make matters worse, Black Noir has been up all night with the researcher drinking Red Bull and they've found Butcher at the compound. Annie calls things off for Huey and though she lets him down gently, it's clear that she realises how dangerous them being together is. It's at this point that we realise that the talking heads throughout have been the deep holding auditions for his wife and though he almost goes back to his old ways, he's talked into taking things into a new direction to win favour back with the Seven. 
I love how he says, I thought I got to choose, and all he gets back is, you do, and you're choosing Cassandra. It's a subtle line to show that he doesn't really have a choice at all, and he's pretty much going to be told what to do until his image is fixed. The Deep loves the Seven, and what comes with it, and in order to do it, he's going to have to let go of the man that he was, and of course, his, his true love. Goodbye. Goodbye. The episode ends with Homelander meeting Doppelganger again, who transforms into him in order to try and please him. It's the weirdest scene in the sea. Scratch that, you know what? It's the weirdest scene in a comic book property ever. And Homelander sees this version of himself and calls it pathetic. He says he doesn't need anyone to love him, he doesn't need anyone, and then kills it, which is when we cut to black. Now, what's going on? Well, clearly, he's off the leash. And over the last couple of episodes, he's been slowly drifting away from Fort, claiming that they need him more than he needs them. I think he will actually go fully rogue, and may even try to take Ryan in order to raise him on his own. At this moment, it seems like that's the only thing he cares about, and he's getting to the point where I'm expecting to just see him lose it. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of things coming down the line, but yeah, w what a strange episode, but, but also a great one. Now as always I'd love to hear your thoughts on it so make sure you comment below and let me know. If you enjoyed this video then please drop a thumbs up and make sure you check out our breakdown of the first three entries which is going to be linked at the end. We're also giving away a free copy of the Christopher Nolan collection and all you have to do to be in with a chance of winning is like the video, subscribe to the channel and drop a comment below. The winner is going to be chosen at random on the 30th of September so make sure you get involved. If you want to support the channel and get to see content early then please consider clicking the join button below. You can also come chat to us on the Discord server linked in the description or at Heavy Spoilers on Twitter. Thanks for making it until the end of the video. You've been the best. I've been Definition. And breast milk, you made my day.